Hi, good afternoon or good morning, depending upon where you are. My name is Ann Greiner. I'm president and CEO of the Primary Care Collaborative. And for those of you who may not be acquainted with PCC, we are a multi-stakeholder membership organization that brings together primary care specialties, behavioral health specialties, consumer groups, employers, health plans, tech groups, pharmaceutical organizations, and the common uh, cause that all these diverse organizations share is strengthening the foundation of our healthcare system so that we can enhance uh, patient health, uh, reduce inequities in care, and also make care more affordable. So welcome. We're pleased to be releasing our um, 13th annual evidence report. But before we get to the release of the report, I did want to invite you to our upcoming summit, which is on November 16th, Keeping People Primary, Building Trust in Better Health in Washington, D.C. There's a link there uh, to register. That evening, we will also be having uh, an awards dinner, the Barbara Starfield Awards Dinner, and we recognize incredible primary care champions of all types. So please do join us in Washington, D.C. Uh, our 13th annual report is entitled Health is Primary, Charting a Path to Equity and Sustainability. And we're very grateful uh, to the partnership that we have with the Robert Graham Center. Uh, and also uh, to the American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation, um, who has provided financial support for this report. Um, we're excited to discuss the implications of the analytic findings in the report and the lit review. Um, and I want to thank um, the various authors who contributed to the report and also um, our diverse and very gifted uh, reviewers. Thank you, uh, authors and reviewers. Um, this report um, uh, will be uh, reflected upon um, by a panel of experts uh, that will bring a clinician point of view, a workforce point of view, and a patient point of view into the conversation. The report uh, reviews the state of primary care access and the primary care workforce in a demand and supply framework. And I think it really helps folks to understand uh, the multiple um, uh, factors that are affecting uh, primary care access. Um, our, our focus really is on how can we strengthen the foundation of primary care, which is the front door of our health system. And behind all this data that you're gonna read about, um, you know, there are stories of real people, and I'm sure you know many of them, and they may be your friends, colleagues, or perhaps yourself, that are having trouble getting uh, access to primary care. Um, within the report, there are quotes from both patients and clinicians about the challenges they're facing, either in obtaining or delivering primary care. So without further ado, let me um, introduce uh, Dr. William Fox. He's gonna help set the stage for the report. Uh, Dr. Fox is chair-elect of the Board of Regents of the American College of Physicians, a member of PCC, and on the Board of Directors. Daryl and Moyer, um, the CEO, is on the Board of Directors. Um, Dr. Fox is an internist who's practicing um, in Charlotte's, Virginia. He received his medical degree from the Perelman School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania, where he also got awards uh, for his primary care uh, focus and commitment. He's been pra in practice for more than 20 years, um, including five years in the National Health Service Corps. So, um, Dr. Fox, thank you for reflecting uh, briefly on the state of primary care for patients and clinicians and for putting our report in context. Well, thank you so much, Anne, and it's great to be here. And it's really an honor to be representing uh, America's internal medicine physicians which along with our colleagues in family medicine and pediatrics and nurse practitioners and physician's assistants really represents the bulk of the primary care workforce uh, in this country. In my day job, as you mentioned, I'm a founder and a partner in a three physician small and still independent primary care practice located in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm speaking to you from one of the exam rooms in my office. I'll be seeing patients in about an hour but our practice is now about 20 years old and our mature practice has really limited ability to accommodate new patients. 
new prospective patients are distressed uh, to say the least when they learn that it might be six to eight months before they can have an initial visit if we can even take them on as a patient at all. Sometimes I learn that the patients are in tears on the phone as they share their stories of the inability to find a primary care physician and pleading with us to please take them on and accept them as patients. Now, such scenarios are no longer unique. As the healthcare journalist and physician, Elizabeth Rosenthal recently wrote in an opinion piece for the Washington Post, she said, quote, the percentage of US doctors in adult primary care has been declining for years and is now at a tipping point beyond which many Americans won't be able to find a family doctor at all. The underinvestment in primary care in this country is staggering. In its landmark report in 2021, implementing high quality primary care, rebuilding the foundation of healthcare, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine said this primary care is vital, primary care is a public good, but primary care is slowly dying. Our country spends a paltry 6% of healthcare dollars on primary care, which is about half of what high performing health systems in sister countries spend. And this, despite the fact that a longitudinal relationship with a primary care clinician is the only relationship in medicine shown to be associated with decreased health expenditures, higher patient satisfaction, fewer hospitalizations and emergency department visits, and lower mortality. Now, two years since the release of that NASM report, and of course exacerbated by the significant disruptions of this pandemic, the percentage of adults reporting they do not have a usual source of care is actually increasing. So it is with this background that I'm both excited and somewhat disheartened to see the current PCC evidence report. Of course, excited that robust evidence is being gathered to help us understand these important workforce issues, but disheartened by the findings that primary care workforce continues to dwindle despite a higher than ever demand. And we have yet to hear bold, widespread commitments and coordinated actions uh, to invest in primary care from the healthcare leaders who control the current allocation of our healthcare resources, which now totals almost 20% of our total economy. So I hope uh, you, along with me, um, look forward to hearing the findings of this year's report and then joining a discussion of solutions and implementation mechanisms that we so desperately need. With that, I would like to introduce the report's lead author. Allison Huffstetler is the medical director at the Robert Graham Center. In addition to overseeing the center's scholars and fellows in conducting research, Dr. Huffstetler sees patients at the Fairfax Family Practice in Northern Virginia and has academic appointments at Virginia Commonwealth University and Georgetown University's Department of Family Medicine. And after Dr. Huffstetler presents the high-level findings, uh, PCC President and CEO Ann Greiner uh, will come back to moderate a discussion among the panelists and will discuss recommendations for policymakers and healthcare leaders. So Dr. Huffstetler, now uh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to all of our attendees. Yesterday, I was sitting in a clinical exam room with a patient and she had no context for what this report is or perhaps even that I'm out a researcher outside of my clinical setting. And she said to me, Dr. H, it took me two months to get an appointment with you and I know you're really busy, but why can't I get an appointment with your clinic and with you? And every time I hear this from a patient, which is fairly frequently, it makes me really feel for them because patients are coming to us not to overload the schedule, not to make lives harder, but rather to get solutions for their problems and have a partner in their health. 
And although I would have loved to respond to her with the evidence from this report, I simply said, send me a message next time and I will make sure to create space for you in my schedule. But it is a wonderful segue into the evidence report that really came from this question of why can't I get a, a visit with my primary care clinician? And so we began a scoping review of the literature. And as we dug further and further, we recognized that the literature fall, falls into two categories, that of supply and that of demand. And while medicine is not a business, it certainly does trend that way sometimes. These models are great for representing the literature on supply of primary care across the United States. And then demand in two separate fashions, demands for primary care, and then the demands on primary care, which I'll be reviewing with you all today. We also have novel analysis for this report. We address the changes in the workforce based on retirement and those entering the primary care workforce over the last 10 years. So let's dive in. There is more than I can say in 10 minutes in this report. So for a glancing overview, let's start at the supply side, looking at workforce projections. There are several agencies that put forth projections, including the Graham Center where I work, but these that you're seeing on the slide are from the Health Resources and Services Administration. And what we find is that the recommended increase in supply is between 20 and 50,000 primary care physicians in the next five years to be adequate. Now that's a very vast difference, that's double the amount. And why is that the case? Well, it depends on what people are estimating as the appropriate number of patients per clinician. If those clinicians are working full time, the geographic distribution and how far patients have to travel to see their clinicians and who all is including in that primary care workforce number. So we do see significant shortages and that is based largely in training. Training has increased insignificantly for nurse practitioners and physicians assistants, while the Balanced Budget Act of 1997 has less, left clinician training fairly stagnant with only moderate growth in the last five to 10 years, in the last 20 years, excuse me. Training locations have a very large impact on where people then go on to practice. What we don't see is much training occurring in the healthcare settings that need it most, the places with shortages. We find that most training hack happens at academic and in urban centers, and then the graduates of those programs go on to stay within those urban centers, which leads us to the rural workforce shortages. We know that rural communities struggle to get access and have worse health outcomes than their urban peers. Fascinatingly, we see an increase in the raw number of nurse practitioners going into those areas. However, we see a decrease in the number of clinicians practicing. Finally, international medical graduates make up about 25% of the physician's workforce in the United States, according to the American Medical Association. And so with international medical graduates contributing significantly, we have to consider the placement and geographic location of their training and where they go on to practice after graduation. Of course, there are changes in the actual clinical practice patterns of clinicians across the United States. I would be remiss not to mention COVID-19 in a presentation like this because we have seen dramatic changes in the way that clinicians are retiring with early retirement. We know that most of our clinicians are over the age of, of 50. About 40% of primary care clinicians are over the age of 50 years old. In order to retain clinicians in the primary care setting, more flexibility is needed when we look at reasons why people are retiring early, we see that it's because they need more time at home or they're trying to take care of themselves and their own health. But for those that actually return back to the patient care setting, they say that it's because they were able to have a more autonomous and flexible schedule. They were able to work the hours that were most conducive to them and they had power over their patient scheduling. And so that flexibility and autonomy brings people back into the clinician workforce. Patient panel size also has changed recently. And while it's very hard to estimate what the best size for a patient panel is, we know that impanelment helps us define who we are taking care of as clinicians, how we can best use team members, and who we can promote to make sure that our patients are getting the most preventive and chronic care management. Now let's move and shift gears into the demand for primary care. 
And what you'll see in this image is a graphic of where people are moving within the United States. So this is domestic net migration. And what we note is that most individuals are moving out of urban centers to far more rural settings. Save Florida. Florida in a cliche, uh, cliche way is the place that people are going to retire over 65. But otherwise, we see a decentralization from urban areas to more rural areas. However, we don't see the clinician workforce working in those areas at the same rate. Of course, people are getting older in the United States and they have increased medical complexity, which demands more medical care. We also see that there's an increased demand for medical school training and that there have been large numbers of medical schools that have opened in the last 15 years without a significant rise in the number of residency positions that are available. This graphic specifically states where there are individuals over 65 years old in comparison to where there are primary care clinicians per 100,000 people. And what you can see here is that in the deep south and in the west of the United States, we have net migration from within the United States to locations that don't necessarily have the capacity to care for those populations in various counties. So what about the demands on primary care? Well, we know from literature, it is very clear that the social determinants have a much larger weight on a person's health than anything I can do in their clinical setting. Screening for social determinants has become a much more regular practice within the primary care setting with many tools available to do so. And while recommending bodies like the United States Preventive Services Task Force don't recommend universal screening at this point, we can see that specific populations who are high risk for things like housing instability, financial and instability and poverty, and those that have transportation needs benefit from screening, screening and interventions within the primary care setting. And I'll extend this to loneliness. Loneliness has a huge impact, especially in our elderly communities. And those that have expressed loneliness have worse health outcomes and need higher uh, levels of care within the primary care setting. Behavioral health and mental illness takes more than a 15 minute visit. One fifth of Americans have a diagnosis of a mental health disorder. And in order to be able to care for those people, we have to have the capacity to do so. And like I said, within the small time that we have with patients, mental health and behavioral health often fall off the radar of what clinicians are able to attend to. And finally, administrative burden. This is the thing that we think of as pajama time. So when I go home at the end of my day, what are the tasks that remain in my inbox? What documentation remains to be done? What prior authorization forms are there? And these are leading to more and more demands outside of the clinical experience and outside of my direct patient care and our communal direct patient care with patients. So where do these two things collide? And there are many areas in which they do. First, we see that team-based care can really mediate some of the supply and demand issue. We really should be using all of the team members to the highest level of their licensure. And this is a fundamental team role. With teams, you can increase continuity, you can increase access and improve outcomes for patients. We'd like to see our workforce reflect and mirror the patients we serve. This starts much earlier than medical school, nursing school, or any similar. Outreach into the middle school and high school uh, to students has been shown to increase their interest in the medical career field and help ensure that those dyads and teams promote better health outcomes as concordant uh, workforce with patients do. Direct primary care offers an innovative model to increase patient satisfaction outside of the insurance model. While we see that this does improve patient and clinician satisfaction, it oftentimes does come at a cost of a reduced patient panel size. Retail clinics offer quite timely access and urgent care for patients, which is also associated with increased patient, uh, patient satisfaction scores. However, it does decrease continuity and leaves us with questions about antibiotic stewardship. And finally, telehealth has been a wonderful increased supply model to meet the demands of patients who can't make it into the office. However, not all of America has broadband and not all patients are able to use the functionality of telehealth. So let's dig into some novel analysis and there is more of this in the report. But from a brief overview, 
we evaluated the net change in the number of clinicians who are active in the workforce between 2014 and 2019. This includes MDs, DOs, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants. And what we see is that we have a net loss of around 10 clinicians per 100,000 people across the United States that is not being compensated for by those entering the workforce. If we look at physicians alone, we see an even worse picture. There is almost no growth of the inflow side, but because we have a very large proportion of physicians that are over the age of 55, we see an increasing retirement rate and a net loss of nearly 15 physicians per 100,000 people in different communities. I will leave it to Ann Greiner to tell you a little bit more about the policy implications, but I'm happy to take questions at the end regarding any of these details. Thanks so much. Wow, thanks so much, Allison. Um, great uh, overview, and there is so much in that report. Um, Allison just gave us some top line um, findings. Let me um, bring our panelists um, uh, onto the stage, if you will, and also we'll ask them if they have any um, questions for Allison. So um, uh, we've got, as we said earlier, a fantastic panel. Um, uh, let me first introduce uh, Dr. Danae Moore. Um, she is assistant professor uh, at the VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University Department of Family Medicine and Population, and director of the department's family medicine clerkship. She's an active member of the Virginia Academy of Family Physicians, where she is president uh, for 2023 and 2024, and co-chair of the resident student and faculty committee. Uh, she, prior to joining the faculty at VCU, she practiced at a federally qualified health center in Charlottesville, Virginia. We've got a lot of Virginians uh, here today. Uh, Frederick Asasi um, is an attorney uh, with an MPH, executive director of Families USA, a national organization that for over 40 years has been working at both the national and state level to ensure that the best health and health care are accessible, for all and affordable to all. Uh, uh, Frederick is a national expert on a wide range of healthcare issues, including value coverage, equity, and frequently testifies in front of Congress and does a bang up job, I would like to underscore. Um, Dr. Joyce uh, Knestrick, uh, she's professor at George Washington University, past president of the American Association of Nurse Practitioners, uh, practices as a primary care provider in rural Appalachia, West Virginia, caring for low income and underserved populations. And she's been a family nurse practitioner for over 30 years, a nurse educator for 35, and is active in maintaining high quality education for nurse practitioners. And last but not least, um, Aaron Frere, tenured professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Director of the California Healthcare Workforce Research Center, and that center provides state and federal policymakers with data and evidence to inform healthcare training, deployment, and regulation in a rapidly changing healthcare system. That is uh, absolutely true. Erin uh, is immediate past chair of the Council on Graduate Medical Education, or COGME. And which is charged with advising the Secretary of U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and Congress on workforce trends, training, and financing. So, as you can see, we have an incredible panel. Let me first ask if anyone has any clarifying questions for Allison, and then we'll um, get into your reactions. Okay, well, Allison did such a bang up job that I think all the findings are incredibly clear and you all had a chance to read them. So that's, that's super. So um, my first question is really um, getting your uh, reaction to the overall findings and what you found most compelling or surprising or interesting. And I'm gonna um, start with Dr. Moore and from here on in, um, just uh, call you by your first names. So, um, Danae. Thanks for this question, Anne, and uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate in today's webinar. And good morning or good afternoon to those of you who are joining us. 
my reaction to the analytic findings and the literature review is that both accurately describe the supply and demand factors that pose challenges for patients in the United States having a primary care clinician and a primary care home. I specifically identified the outflow of primary care clinicians being larger than the inflow as illustrated in the tables that Dr. Huffstetler presented earlier as the most important factor contributing to the primary care crisis that we have in the nation. This imbalance in the number of people, uh, primary care clinicians entering the workforce and then leaving the workforce decreases the likelihood that everyone in the United States will have access to a primary care clinician and have timely access to primary care services. For many primary care clinicians, uh, the wait time to, for a new patient to have an appointment and be seen in the office can be several months, as illustrated by Dr. Fox's earlier comments. And then even for our established patients um, who have a new health concern who need to be seen in the office for that, it can take several weeks for those patients to be seen. So my hope is that the stakeholders in the medical community can come together and collaborate to successfully address this workforce challenge that we're facing in primary care. Thank you so much. And I think we would agree on, um, we won't get to bold change unless we really work across all of these groups um, and, and demand it. And that includes consumer groups. Uh, Frederick. Thank you so much. Um, terrific report and a really big thank you for, for releasing it. This is a really important conversation for us to be having as a nation, as you know, and you know, fam and as you stated, families you say exist to ensure the best health and healthcare equally accessible and affordable all. And our, our deep belief is that primary care is the key on delivering that promise of the best health possible. Primary care allows patients to maintain good health. It allows health uh, problems to be identified and addressed early. And importantly, primary care can be the linchpin in patients who need uh, care as they're allowing them to su successfully navigate through the complex healthcare system. It has such an important role. And we know that when we look at, as, as you guys point out in your report, the, the best healthcare systems in, in the world, they have really robust and effective primary care delivery systems. So this is really critical um, to ensuring all families in our nation have their best health possible. And then as your report highlights, we are really struggling and things are getting worse. Uh, more than a third of the people in our nation have not been able to receive primary care. That's really startling. And we're seeing the rate of primary care clinicians leaving the profession more than doubling, while we know that the uh, aging population is increasing demand for primary care. Um, and at the same time, you know, we're at families, we're fighting very hard on some of the cost and affordability issues in our system. Um, healthcare costs continue to go uh, up much, much faster than our paychecks. Um, but the proportion of spending on primary care, while all of these costs go up and our spending is generally going up, the proportion of spending on primary care is diminishing. And that's really startling. And I wanted to point out, um, you know, that, that most of the data in this report is based on pre-pandemic levels. And we know that it, the situation is probably worse. We've got more burnout. We've got more early retirements. We've got more practices closing because of the pandemic. So you guys are really, uh, I think, in a powerful and important way, highlighting we've got to get much more focused on solving the primary care access problem. Um, as you point out, it has really important equity dimensions to it. We know that families of color or families living in poor uh, rural or urban areas are much more, uh, much less likely to access primary care. That means they're less likely to be healthy, less likely to address health problems early. They're gonna have a higher, not just disease burden, but uh, cost burden. So it has a lot of repercussions. So we agree wholeheartedly with uh, PCC and with the report that one of the most important things to do that we have is we have to address the economic incentives that underlie primary care. And first and foremost, we have to increase payment uh, to primary care clinicians. It will attract more people into the field. It will keep more people in the field. It is the fundamental problem. So we're very big proponents of that. We also believe strongly in embracing new models that allow for capitated payments so that a primary care clinician can actually care for a population of patients and not have to be focused on just volume, 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 volume through fee-for-service healthcare. Um, and so, you know, I think there's so much in this report that we can take and we can use to move policymakers and in particular, I think the last thing I wanted to say was, you know, as we're fighting so hard, there's over a trillion dollars of waste in the US healthcare system. It's an enormous amount. Um, you know, how is it possible with all of the spending 
uh, that continues to increase that we're actually spending less on primary care proportionally. It's, it's really unconscionable. And so one of the things we're fighting for is, is we're trying to address things like corporate uh, hospital pricing abuses or uh, prescription drug pricing abuses um, as we're finding ways to actually reduce the total uh, cost we should take those savings and we should reinvest them in the primary care and we should do things like increase re reimbursement rates for primary care providers increase support for primary care training increase support for diversity within primary care training things like that so i think the last point i wanted to make was there is a real movement around the, the country that's trying to tackle affordability and out of control costs and that movement can join forces with primary care and we can actually fund uh, a much more robust and a much more accessible primary care system for our nation. Well, thank you so much, Frederick. And you can see that um, Frederick is very effective on, on Capitol Hill and immediately went to the policies. Like, we're not just going to talk about the problems, we're going to talk about the policies. But I'm going to hold, ask you to hold on that for a moment um, and and talk uh, about the the findings, and then we're going to even go further on the on the some of the ideas that Frederick has put on the table related to policy. But um, Joyce, your your reflection on the finding and what you think uh, perhaps are the you know there's a lot of supply and demand factors. Perhaps what you think is the biggest contributor to the primary care access issues we're facing. So I'm really not uh, surprised, like everyone um, else uh, said, about the uh, amount of the shortages in primary care. And working in a rural underserved area like uh, my other panelists have uh, also experienced, it, it's very difficult uh, to attract and keep people um, in underserved areas. Um, nursing, we've worked to try to um, use community-based models to bring um, education to students to try to keep them in uh, communities uh, where they are able to um, that they're, they're already part of the community like where I practice and so you're more likely to stay in that community but that's not always effective either um, but I think that primary care has that patient-centered focus part that really um, brings attention to the importance of having that relationship and having the patient at the center of the relationship. And I think um, that's important for all primary care clinicians and important for the communities that we serve because we're, you know, the communities I serve generally have trust elements uh, with providers. Um, and so it takes time to build that uh, element of trust. And if people are going to leave, uh, then that trust diminishes and it's hard to, to make changes. So uh, so I'm not surprised. I I'm interested to see what happens with the data post uh, COVID because I think physicians and nurse practitioners and physicians uh, associates alike are um, leaving uh, the profession due to burnout, particularly nurses. And uh, I know that in our, uh, across our schools, our nurse practitioner programs numbers are slightly down, uh, most likely because of uh, burnout after COVID-19 or maybe staying uh, in their current positions because there's no one else to fill those positions. So I think there's gonna be an impact on workforce um, after uh, we see what happens at the end of the pandemic. Thanks so much. And since both Frederick and Joyce uh, mentioned the pandemic, not only um, have we seen an impact on the primary care workforce, but we've also seen an impact on patients. So we've lost two years of life expectancy over the last couple of years. And, you know, that is uh, a huge um, uh, drop. Uh, and I think, you know, analysis is ongoing about what are the contributors to the uh, loss of life expectancy. But, um, you know, uh, we were not a healthy population going into COVID. Um, it is likely uh, a contributor to why we didn't do so well amongst many other contributors. And now patients are, are, are not um, healthy. They, you know, have unmet demand. They weren't necessarily able to get the chronic care management they needed, the preventive services. So uh, kind of a hot mess um, that we we need to address. Aaron. 
Yes, thanks. It's great to join you all. As a health workforce researcher and data wonk, I am thrilled to be talking about data and research and just want to really applaud the efforts here. They're just remarkable. I also want to start with really applauding the fact that this report acknowledges the nuance that has been there. Do we have a primary care shortage? Do we not have a primary care shortage? I can tell you as someone who's been talking about having a primary care shortage specifically in needed specialties and geographies and settings, I'm not talking about an overall primary care shortage. So an overall shortage of bodies, but then how do we get them to the right places, the right settings? So I just want to acknowledge incredible, incredible work there. And then I want to say that the report does a really nice job setting up this conceptual framework of inflows and outflows. I want to add to that and say it's not just about inflows, it's also about the workplace environment and retention in the middle and then outflows. So within that concept, I wanna say inflows, I'm actually feeling a little bit better about even despite the fact that we spend $16 billion on Medicare and are not getting the primary care workforce that we need. And one of the reasons that I'm feeling better about things is that you do see some movement through the Consolidated Appropriations Act that's talked about in the report. But I also, one of the things that we haven't talked about that I wanna talk about is the work that's being done through HRSA, through the Rural Residency Planning and Development and the Teaching Health Center Graduate Medical Education Programs. Those are two incredibly important programs and they are, for example, the Rural Residency Planning and Development Program has developed 521 new accredited physicians. And these are in underserved communities, most of them in family medicine. So I put that out there as a, we need to be thinking about place-based, community-based training because the outcomes, as Candace Chen and others' work has shown us, are really tremendous. I also want to say on the inflow side that we need to be watching states. States are not going to wait for the feds to move on this. They are moving on their own through their 1115B waivers, through state Medicaid investments in graduate medical so let's keep our eye on that. And when we get to the policy implications, there's a huge piece for evaluation there and lessons learned from what states are doing. Um, so let's let's go from inflows to the to the practice environment, right? And so as the work of the Larry Green Center and others have highlighted. We really are seeing, and we've been talking about um, today, is this impact on the well-being of primary care physicians. Um, and one of the things that I want to highlight as a workforce modeler is if you lose a primary care physician in the middle of their career, you have lost 20 to 25 years of their practice if they don't come back. So early retirement is problematic, but mathematically, I'm more worried about those middle career people who are exiting and may not come back. So retention, to me, Anne, is the most important place where we need to be drawing our attention to. And we also need better data. And it's not just the numbers, and we're going to talk about that, I hope. But I also want to highlight and shout out that we need richer data on what, what's happening at the practice level. And I want to call your attention to a paper that just came out in Social Science and Medicine by a colleague sent, funded through our center. It's called Physicians as Shock Absorbers, the System of Structural Factors Driving Burnout and Dissatisfaction in Medicine. I encourage you all to read this because it's a rich ethnographer, or an ethnography of what's happening at the individual, professional, organizational, and societal level that's driving these factors, which then points to recommendations. And I know we're gonna hold on that to the next section. And the only other thing I'd say, so we did inflows, we did retention, outflows. Let's talk about the fact that data are a little problematic. We don't actually have good data on actual exits. And so that's that need for continuous evaluation to figure out how many people have actually exited, who has exited, who's most at risk, Who's not at risk? Is there a gendered effect? I suspect there is. Is there how I identify racially, ethnic? Is there an effect there? Is there an effect by where I practice? So that's the sort of model that I'd like to go back to. I love that inflows, outflows. I want to add workplace environment. <laughs> Thank you. We have that chart, and I think Eric in the report, in the executive summary in the bottom of the report, I think you've got a couple more uh, uh, things to put on put on the chart, and appreciate that. Um, there there was a lot just to get you know, these factors. And I think you've added um, many more things for us to think about. Okay, um, let's just, I'm, I've got a slide on policy, I believe. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about the policy recommendations in the report. And I'm sure that you all uh, uh, may want to put some additional ones on, on the board. Um, first off, we need much better data. We don't know um, uh, where nurse practitioners and physician associates are practicing. Um, and we need to know that um, so we can really understand um, what's going on with the workforce. Uh, we also um, don't have an appreciation for, um, uh, you know, in a very granular way, expenditures on primary care, 
by by at the county level, <clears throat> by um, uh, by program, by payer, all of that would be very helpful for us to understand. Um, you know, how are we doing with investment in primary care? As as many of you said, it's been on the decline. Um, the recent data that came out of Millbank Memorial Fund and the Graham Center is we're at 4.6 percent, less than five cents on the dollar. Dialysis is 6% of our um, primary care spend. We know if we did a better job on primary care, we might not have as many patients needing dialysis. It's just uh, a pet peeve of mine that you know we keep seeing this decline of, of primary care spend. We also need better data on you know, how we're paying um, primary care so that we can effectuate these changes. So uh, recommendation number two is about um, changing how we pay and how much we pay primary care. And um, at the Primary Care Collaborative, we've really taken a page and a lot of guidance from the recent National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine report that came out in 2021 that uh, recommends that we move to hybrid payment across all payers, um, a mix of fee-for-service and prospective payment. We also uh, know that we need to expand community health centers and we need the reauthorization of community health centers and that's what congress i hope is going to continue to work on and get it over the goal line soon i think aaron brought up this whole notion of um how do we retain our existing workforce because after all of this investment to lose that workforce is really a blow. Um, and so, you know, I think in the report, you'll see that there are some recommendations on, um, on more support with more flexible arrangements, being able to uh, work across state lines more readily, um, you know, uh, additional ways to um, retain beyond, you know, uh, uh, more, more uh, financing and more money. And that would support our primary care team. Because we know that given the multiplicity of patient needs, a doc or an NP and a, or a PA and an MA is not going to solve for all of those problems. So we need a financing system that actually supports the whole team. Uh, we, we also have a set of recommendations about how do we incentivize more um, folks to get in the primary care um, pipeline in the first place and folks that look like the rest of the population, you know, that really reflect um, the population that is currently um, uh, that we have, and it doesn't right now. There's a disconnect between a more white um, clinician population and the diversity of, of the U.S. population. So that needs to be squared. And then finally, um, we see that employers have a role to play in um, promoting the importance of a, of a primary care relationship, but also uh, uh, addressing the financial barriers that get in the way of patients accessing primary care. So, you know, high deductible health plans without any way, um, you know, to get over that barrier after screening and actually access primary care. Uh, and there are other um, creative solutions. So why don't we take the slide down and I'm going to open it up. Who wants to jump in first to respond to some of the policy recommendations and perhaps uh, put some of your own on the table. I'm happy to start. So um, not surprisingly, as a data geek, I, I would like to focus a little bit on the on the data box. Um, so I do think that, it, as we've talked about, this need to really understand pandemic effects is critical. And so I think we actually need to improve and invest in data systems that allow us to track um, workforce exits and to really understand who is exiting, where are they in their career, and looking at those factors. Because the data that we have are not terrific, to be honest, um, some of the, the national data sets. So I think that's an area where we really need to invest because by knowing that we can know who's particularly vulnerable and where to target interventions, number one. Number two, I've talked a lot about retention, but retention's hard because we don't actually have great evidence around which retention measures actually keep people at which point in their career, right? So if you think about a primary care physician of course, across the course of their career, a, a newly practicing primary care physician may need something very differently for retention than the middle career, than the end of career. And I think we really have to both build those policy and, and interventions at each point in the life course or in the career trajectory, but we need to build the evidence. What works? When does it work? How does it work? Um, I think is critical. 
I also think, and this work is already happening, uh, is to really understand these team-based models of care. Who's doing what, right? So if you look at different configurations of say primary care physicians, pharmacists, and social workers in practice, what roles are they each playing? And how does that influence the types of services that different team configurations can provide? Because that's ultimately going to, as you mentioned in the report, increase capacity, potential to reduce burnout, but also to increase access to primary care services. So I think that team-based recommendation is absolutely critical, but really understanding what's happening. And then the last thing I think we really, I just kudos to this report for acknowledging re-entry. I thought that was an amazing like nuance that has to get shout out because for those people who have exited, how do we get them back into practice, right? How do we think about re-entry strategies to support people? What are the wraparound services that they may need? What do they need in terms of perhaps retaking their boards? How do we think about flexible scheduling, telehealth opportunities for people who don't wanna to come to the clinic or for people who are near retirement, can we actually put them as preceptors so that we also have a preceptor shortage? So thinking about you know neat, nice ways that we can actually build and preceptor tax credits are another thing to think about. So just a set of recommendations I've been thinking about sort of across these buckets and across the life course. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I want to make sure that we have time for questions, particularly from any news media that um, might have joined us today. And I know we've got some uh, media interviews scheduled um, uh, post, post this webinar. Um, so uh, if you could you know, just keep keep your answers short so we get those questions in. I appreciate it. Who else wants to get on the board? I can share my thoughts about policy. Yeah. So I think there are a couple of key policy points that we should think about um, to try to address this. So one, I think primary care payment reform is urgently needed because that really is the key avenue to enhancing primary care access and delivery in the United States. Primary care payment reform, as I see it, could enhance the recruitment of clinicians to primary care, particularly um, in areas where there are um, workforce shortages. So um, where I'm from, I'm from Dinwiddie, Virginia, it's very rural. Um, and so there you know, has been a challenge historically being able to get um, physicians to these rural communities to be able to provide the much needed care to these patients who tend to um, have a lot of medical complexity and social determinants of health um, affecting their care. Um, and then also I think if we can reform our primary care payment, we can also really help build a robust multidisciplinary team around the primary care clinicians. So and those folks could include social workers, um, care managers, behavioral health specialists, and pharmacists, um, all of whom I currently have the privilege of working with and has really helped enhance the, the care delivery that I can provide. I think if we can build up those teams and we can provide comprehensive whole person care within the medical home, that would be uh, really great for our patients and help them achieve better health. Um, and really this investment in primary care payment reform is going to require more investment in primary care from many uh, stakeholders, so public insurance programs, commercial payers, as well as employers. Also, I think it's going to be key that we make sure that we're recruiting our middle and high school students um, in our communities that um, have a great need for primary care. Recruit them early, tell them about primary care careers, what it's like, identify and support those students in their educational journey if they express an interest in going into primary care um, because there you know are some data to show that if we can recruit people from those medically underserved rural and urban communities um, and be able to train them a lot of times they are more likely to go back to those communities and be able um, to serve those folks and, and give them good primary care so i think by you know really investing more in primary care we can really help improve people's access to health care and help them achieve better health outcomes um, and quality of life Thank you. Lots of ideas there um, uh, today. Appreciate it. Um, Frederica Joyce. I, I would just like to say that I, I would think it's important um, the issue of everyone practicing up to the full scope of their licensure is really important because we need every person in primary care to be able to to you know provide that patient centered care at every level and and we need to be able to get paid um, properly and accurately. Um, for that service. So I think that is a huge piece that often gets missed and I think it's very important. Thanks for that. Frederick. Oops. To, sorry, to go back to the, to the earlier point I was making, I think that um, the public just are not aware 
of this reality. They live it, but they're not aware of it from in the way yeah. in which this, the report really lays it out. And um, there is such a powerful movement happening right, right now around the country around how unaffordable healthcare has become for families, how much yeah. uh, costs have gone up in corporate healthcare settings, like in hospitals or big corporate uh, specialty groups. That is an opportunity. Um, the American people, if we ask them, um, and maybe we should do this at families, maybe we'll do this as a polling, uh, polling exercise, but if we ask them, would you rather see a dollar invested in that local hospital, corpor that, uh, hospital corporation down the street um, or to expand access to primary care? The American people want access to primary care. Um, and so I just think the more that we can build linkages between the ways in which we can redistribute dollars from these very high cost centers into primary care, the more we're going to win this fight. Yeah, I'd like to follow on that, Frederick, because when you ask people what is their biggest concern about healthcare, they say cost. Yeah. And um, I think there is not necessarily an appreciation that if you have good primary care and good prevention uh, efforts and ongoing chronic care management, and also conversations about changing um, behaviors that might be leading to poor health, um, you can really um, uh, reduce cost to the patient and eventually cost to the whole healthcare system. Um, but no, we just keep, uh, you know, not, you know, 40% of people in 2019 did not have a primary care visit, okay? So what was happening to those folks when they were not getting needed preventive and chronic care management? Potentially, you know, their conditions were getting worse and then they need um, more expensive and frankly, you know, uh, more complicated care. Uh, and, you know, qu their quality of life is not going to be as good. You know, so, I mean, I think I think you're very wise uh, to think about how do we, um, uh, you know, make it clear to the American public that primary care is a way to enhance affordability uh, for them. Um, and we have some other, we've got some policy issues to take care of related to high deductible health plans, et cetera. Um, sure yeah, so I'm gonna take a couple of questions from the uh, all the hundreds of people that have joined us for today. Um, one of the, uh, could one of the panelists speak to the workforce challenges that are particular to um, federally qualified health centers. Um, you know, what kinds of challenges are they facing in recruiting and retaining staff? I can probably speak to that because I uh, helped to establish a federally qualified health center in Charlottesville, Virginia, when I finished my residency training um, and then was the clinical lead there. So yes, the there's a huge workforce shortage and it's not just with primary care clinicians and the FQATs, but also in terms of our support staff. And so as a medical educator, one of the, the big questions I get from students is, you know, we really feel this calling to really serve those folks who have not traditionally had access to care, but we worry about how are we going to be able to do it because primary care has been underfunded for so long and the medical need is great. Do we know for sure we're gonna have the funding available to be able to really staff those offices appropriately and be able to provide, again, that wraparound whole person care that's really needed to take good care of those um, patients. Um, so yeah, it, it's a huge challenge. And I think um, we are moving in the right direction in that we are getting more funding for teaching health centers. So I think it's important, first of all, to make sure that our workforce act and our trainees actually know what are FQHCs, what are the types of care that they deliver, and they get exposure to that early on in their medical training. And so by opening more of the teaching health centers around the country, particularly in areas where there is a need for medical care, where there are access issues and exposing students to what it's like to be in those environments. And if those environments are adequately funded, I think students and trainees will find it very rewarding and be interested in working in those places after uh, they graduate um, from their, their training programs. Um, and any post-grad training that they have. So I think we have taken a step in the right direction in that regard. And then there's always more work to do to make sure that we can sustain it long-term. Thank you. Um, a lot of the policy recommendations in the report and much of what we've been talking about are really at the federal level. Although both Aaron and Frederick have mentioned, 
you know, efforts that are going on more at the state level. So, um, Aaron, I don't know if you want to, um, or, or Frederick, talk about, you know, what are some of the things that you're seeing out there to address um, uh, the primary care access uh, problem and the workforce issues? Well, I would never speak on this issue before Aaron does. She's a living legend. No. <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> Frederick, I feel like, Frederick, go first. <laughs> <laughs> but I, well, I just wanted to lift up that, you know, most people don't realize that when a medical student leaves um, their uh, graduates from medical school and goes on into the residency, that in general, they're forced into a residency that's really centered around specialty care in hospital settings. And it creates a huge drain from people who start out that journey as resident wanting to do primary care. And there are new models that are incredibly successful. And Aaron mentioned a couple of them in particular, Teaching Health Centers has proven unbelievably successful at allowing the locus of training to be the community health center, the community where, where primary care doctors want to practice. And um, they can go do you know, a rotation out into a specialty setting if they need to, when they need to but they get to stay and, and start practicing and train in the community. That is a wildly successful program. Um, we need to get it refunded, to get it, uh, more funding for it, keep it going and grow it. And those are the kind of models, it's the kind of innovation. Aaron was on the ground when this was created years ago with a, with a guy named Van Dirksen, another primary care legend. Um, and we just need to keep going, right? We need to keep uh, examining the ways in which our current system is biased away from primary care towards very high cost specialty care and reorient it towards the, the kind of care that we all know and the research demonstrates, as you said, Anne, not only improves health, not only uh, allows us to address health issues when they come up sooner, but it also provides more uh, affordable care, more accessible care, et cetera. So it's, it's really, really important. Yeah, I think all that's incredibly important. I would add three things that I think states are doing. And listen, I mean, I, I, th we're, we're facing huge pressing issues, but there are some bright spots. And sometimes it's helpful to sort of think about where the innovation is happening. A lot of innovation is happening. So if you think of states as sort of policy laboratories for innovation, how do we leverage and study that and figure out what's working? So number one, states are spending um, about, I think, $7.4 billion currently through Medicaid funding um, to uh, support graduate medical education. And a lot, of, a chunk of that is in primary care and it's place-based sort of rural community health centers, rural hospitals. So a lot happening on Medicaid because Medicaid graduate medical education is much more flexible than Medicare. Um, so you can actually use it in, in ways to address primary care access, including behavioral health. So integrated behavioral health primary care, I think is absolutely critical. Number two, states are doing a lot with their 1115B waivers, which is the way that you can sort of redesign the way that you're using your Medicaid funds. So there are a couple of states, Massachusetts, Oregon, and others who are investing, for example, in behavioral health workforce training through, through nurse practitioners, et cetera. Keep, we need to keep our eye on what's happening with those 1115B waivers be, and study them and actually think about how do we learn from those things to think about what the federal government could learn from and then what states and feds could do so that the, in, the incentives align between the federal and state governments. The last thing I just want to call attention to is I'm super excited about the minimum primary care spend happening across states. As states are saying, started in, by Chris Kohler in Rhode Island and others, sort of looking at sort of what is going to be the minimum amount we as a state invest in primary care. And that has got to, we've got to pay attention to that and we've got to in invest in understanding how does that impact access how does it impact the workforce so those are three things i'm super excited about at the state level that i think we can leverage um, at the federal level thank you so much and our our time is uh quickly coming to a close i want to thank this incredible panel i also want to thank um dr fox for kicking off this conversation and for my colleague um and who's now become a friend um Allison, um, who's first author on this report, who did just an incredible job. Um, uh, please download the report, um, send us your questions, uh, follow us, um, and engage in future webinars with us. Come to our summit on November 16th and our awards dinner. Uh, together, um, we're going to crack this nut and uh, help to improve the nation's health. Thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon.